Professor Washington Obeng, a very warm welcome to this evening's webinar. And uh, we will look forward to uh, your presentation and all the thoughts and ideas you will place before us this evening. Uh, warm welcome, welcome and over to Pashing. Thank you so much, Professor Alexander. As introduction, I am overwhelmed by the technology as well as the warm wishes that you have extended to me. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this conversation for you this evening while it is morning and very early morning for those in the United States. I want to dedicate this conversation to the daughters, sons, adults of cities of Karnataka, Hyderabad, Gujarat, Daman and Dew. I want to thank Shireen and Fiona for introducing us to each other and my family as well as AIA for inspiring me to be a part of such an august discussion. The first question that comes to mind is, when we're negotiating spaces, who has negotiating ability? Do we have equal access and resources to negotiate. So let me try to respond to some of these questions. 22 years ago, the first group of CDs who are Indians of African origin, who number about 70,000 in India, and I met at the Yelapo market in Uttara, Canada, North Karnataka, India. We exchanged smiles, which made the men who were traveling with me ask why the CDs were smiling at me. Their answer was simply, he is one of us. Though it was the first time of our meeting, these men and women recognized some similarities between them and me. Besides our common humanity, it took the next few years for me to then interact with them in different spaces, their homes, their workplaces, farms, marriage ceremonies, festivals, funerals, for us to build on that initial skin tone affinity is one of us. When I asked how they got to India, their stories varied, but a common theme in whatever they shared was that many years ago, some British people brought their forebears to India to serve various purposes and they were left in India. So then the question is, who took them to India? Why were they taken there? How have they fared in India? How have they contributed to India's multilingual, multi-faith, cultural diversity? landscape. Upon investigation, I learned that they arrived in India as part of waves of voluntary and forced migrations that preceded the transatlantic slave trade. So who had the maritime power to do this? So we get a sense of power dynamic people that used maritime power to carry thousands of humans from their native communities 
to other lands to serve the interest and purpose of those who wielded such extraordinary power and privilege. How did, they, how did those with such naval and industrial privilege use the disposition of their privilege to benefit themselves at the disadvantage of others? The powerful needed other times to settle and trade in goods and humans in the end for their own benefits. Is that not what the colonizer does? Is that not what colonization is all about? And in trying to respond to some of these questions, stay with me for the next few minutes to explore issues that can be brought to bear on our conversation today. Because we can support, inspire, strengthen one another to understand the power play that denies other people of their humanity. And more importantly, find constructive ways to disrupt, dismantle colonialism on micro and macro levels in our daily lives as we know how it works. As had been touched upon earlier, we often regard colonizers as Euro-Americans. Colonizers are therefore always perceived to be foreign imperialists. However, a closer look at colonization will help us understand how we can tackle its never-ending, corrosive, destructive power at personal, social, domestic, and international levels. But how do we provide sustained support to negotiate spaces for our well-being and the well-being of others? When everywhere we turn, there are entrenched attitudes, entrenched structures, that either imprison us or prevent us from self-actualizing who we can be. This is important because the systems of power we deploy to distinguish ourselves from individuals and groups are always complex and varied. In India, for instance, there are communities that by virtue of their caste, religion, tribe, class, geographic location, skin color, or gender are perceived, addressed, treated as an alien or as the other in popular imagination. Scholars who write about the colonizer and the colonized groups in India often would pay attention to the stratified society that is also castified. And then they argue against the legacy of the Euro American the colonial structures because such structures continue to oppress people. This conversation will therefore use examples of power of exclusionary attitudes towards people of African descent how these attitudes are rooted in racism, caste categories, xenophobia, sexism, and therefore will also address the adverse impact on the ethnic minority group, sometimes called Hapshis, or CDs, to comment on the social justice, human rights implications regarding forms of discrimination in India and by implication elsewhere. While but other forms of discrimination may target individuals and groups based on class, caste, religion, and geographic location, attention to other minorities within the bounded spaces of our countries, particularly India, helps us understand the intersections of inter in, uh, ethnicity, gender, caste, 
tribal status, and, and the whole idea of belonging. This conversation will expand to how overt and unconscious biases that are part of colonizing forces continue to affect our lives and how we can begin to change such situations. The efforts will be used to subvert taking for granted colonial attitudes and systems. This is also not to encourage local or global parochialism or destructive nativism that is blind to self-empowerment and general development of communities. Nor am I suggesting that we should, without thinking, embrace all of today's colonizing impact of populism or wokeness, a sense of entitlement to smartness beyond measure, divorced from responsibility. I am woke, meaning that I know it all, not that, or the impact of social media products of today. That's not what we're talking about. However, under the weight of Euro-American studies and influences, including today's totalizing social media, much attention has been paid to the transatlantic slave trade, to the virtual neglect of the Mediterranean, Red Sea, Trans-Saharan, Arabian Sea, and Indian Ocean slave trade, where the Arabs, the Dutch, the English, French, Portuguese, Americans, and some Indian trading companies not involved in carrying people from different parts of the world to others. Cities, Hafshis, or sometimes called Kafirus and Abyssinians form part of the forced and voluntary migrations of Africans to South Asia. So the descendants of Africans in India who are numerically and economically, as well as socio-politically a minority, are among those whose existence, visible and invisible, are a rude reminder of the slaving activities that one can point to around the world. These examples will be used to illustrate how their voices are as important as those that are represented on this webinar. First, how about the antecedent practices, cultural norms, names that some people did have before they were extracted from their immediate environments to other places? Yes, it is true that some Africans were complicit in the capture and selling of other Africans, especially victims of warfare, death yes. penalty, payment, and the like. Tell me if that is not what colonialism does. What then is colonialism? Because of its positions of power are manifest in many ways. Who names others? Who takes others from one place to another? Who restricts the movement of other people? And what is the purpose of categorizing some people into groups and subgroups? First, the naming. Cities who have lived in India for over 800 years have played major and minor roles in different contexts. Some were sent to the eastern port of Bengal, Calcutta, then Pondicherry. Others were sent to different places, as I have mentioned before. The scholars John MacLeod and Kenneth Robbins have written a book titled African Elites in India, Habshi Amarat, in which they even talk about African Indians rose as merchants, nobles, statesmen, rulers, eunuchs, 
that were found in India between the 15th and 20th centuries. Therefore, it's not all, all of the Africans that were the victims of the slave trade. This plurality idea is important because whenever we are discussing post-colonialism, it's important for us to pay attention to those that are differently situated, multiplicity of identities within the people that we are describing. In India, however, the general term used for them is Sidi or Hapshi. And this is racially descriptive term. The term is believed to be a corruption of Said. But these labels are embedded in Indian local, state, and national constructs, such as records that socially assigned the African Indians specific locations in such a way as to regard all of them as foreigners or today as tribal people. Such a racial term was imposed on them. Therefore, the word Sidi constitutes in some contexts a social stigma. Though treated thus as a homogeneous people who are historically, culturally, and socially an outgroup in India, they as I'm trying to point out, are a critical part of the global citizenry as our conversation today. They are an important group whose very presence and contributions in South Asia help us to understand how their experience in their geosocial and religious displacements have endured for all these years and ways in which they resist the exploitation. This is to say that they are not hapless victims of exploitation or colonial experience because they have struggled and continue to struggle for the freedom to create their personal collective sovereignty and by so doing have generated cultural, political action in Gujarat, Karnataka, Hyderabad, Dew and Daman. Yes, yes, they have adjusted to both pre-modern and modern Indian conditions by developing practices consistent with Indian and African symbols that reinforce both their own distinctive character and their identity as Indians. If they are doing all this, then why is their experience important within the dialogue on colonialism? Because present day usage of colonialism often refers to the reign of the settler or the disposition of the settler towards those among whom the settler may have settled. However, we understand that the roots for colonization is the Latin colonus for someone who settles, cultivates, or farms land. Then where are the people whose lands were taken and cultivated? Where are their voices in the definition? Are they just victims of the colonizer? Or that by definition, their humanity and agency have been erased or silenced. Is it not true that Euro-Americans regarded what they were doing around the world as cultivating people and lands, using the powerfully ideological term as civilizing, Christianizing, or turning infidels to those that believe in God? During Industrial Revolution, as we all know, it became necessary for citizens to define themselves with reference to a nation or state to indicate 
that they were no longer bound or tied to land that required cultivation, as Komarov and Komarov argue in their 2018 book. But then, remember the first point that I made, that maritime travels during those times fostered trading activities. But before the Europeans were the Arabs, before them were the Romans, before then, and alongside the Romans were the Greeks, the Ottoman Empire. All these people have created colonies around the world. And to quote the French who has been quoted very often, Edward Said in his Orientalism, argued and argued with other scholars that the colonized world, global south, is always considered to be incomplete or lacking. Why? Because all their efforts are set against standards of Euro-Americans. And as I have hinted, the Greeks, the Romans, the Moors, the Ottomans were establishing colonies around specific times. Colonialism, therefore, is not frozen in specific time or place. So the fact that India, Ghana, United States were once colonized by the same country, England, makes this series on post-colonialism relevant and timely. Timely, not because such conversations have never happened before. Timely because during today's Eight. pandemic that relativizes all people, rich or poor, global Eight. north and global south, it is imperative for us to tackle the thorny issue of colonialism within our own borders, on our own level, within intellectual exercises. Therefore, post-coloniality or post-colonialism is not an idea. It's not just a theory, but rather a phenomenon that seriously has and continues to shape and shape the lives of billions of people. Is it not true that this is the time for us to then gesture thoughts and actions to decolonize not only ideas, but also to understand what colonization is all about. How can we then colonize or decolonize thought, affect, and practice? Is it not true that for over 500 years, the historical, sociocultural, educational landscape of billions of people, people have been shaped by, by the totalizing influence of colonialism, as Achille Mbembe in 2015 puts it. And this observation is very important. We, as human beings, have the responsibility and accountability to act and think of ways to reorder our lives despite the devastating impact of colonization. How do we then, in a non-apologetic manner, own our own traditional ways of knowing, production of knowledge, systems of thought and being, and by so doing, challenge, subvert, disrupt the master narratives and practices that are cloaked in colonialist or Western superior in fine, inferior binary oppositions in our local settings. Since European Renaissance, through the Enlightenment to today's obsession with developmentalism and notions of democracy and power of social media, the match and overwhelming spread of colonialist systems and worldviews 
seem to be unstoppable. So how do we go about understanding the mechanisms that are often used? Number one, imaging, imaging based on classificatory system. Such a person comes from the South. This group comes from village A or B. This individual belongs to a particular state or caste. Therefore, their thinking, the behavior of such people will be subordinated to the one doing the classification. Number two. We also have to be mindful of what has been called internalized oppression, whereby we are caught in disparaging mindset towards our own people because of self-negating attitudes that affect our self-image. This is where self-fulfilling prophecies occur because we have accepted distortions about ourselves and our own people, we in turn externalize such distortions without critically critiquing what others are saying, what others are writing about us, and the stories that people weave about us. This leads to wholesale assimilation or colonially constructed forms of education, institutions, processes that regard us as inferior. This is a trap. It's a trap into which we fall often. Because if we restrict the totality of our being to thinking, rationality, then we are found in the age of enlightenment where people emphasized only the mind and not human feelings, the sensibilities that constitute our humanity. I want to invite all of us to begin to pay attention to the totality of our being so that if we are looking for solutions in the face of the opportunities, our thought processes, our norms, our ways of knowing, and culture-specific ideas can be used as strategies that tap into our lived experiences. Because for a long time, such experiences have been regarded as inadequate with their physical, emotional, and psychological challenges. But if we understand that our daily realities of billions of people are being silenced, erased, or framed by colonial emotions, monocultural customs, cosmologies, and registers, then we can begin our own dreams beyond the received or authorized versions of politics, history, economics, and education. It is without a doubt that we live in a world system with its asymmetrical power relations that are constructed and justified by unchecked forces. Yet, the creators of such structures present themselves as always occupying the normative position while all other societies have to live by what their norms are. Such hegemonic colonial world order deliberately undermines diversity of thoughts, feelings, languages, ways of learning, and of knowing. Although, although we know of our differences, we know of our diversity, we know of our multiplex complex experiences. We are always being treated as optional extras. But all things non-Western 
or not belonging to Christian top philosophies and mythologies are often considered to be not important. Let me now give you examples of how the cities in their own right are asserting themselves. Take the polyrhythmic music and dancing styles that capture people's lives but are being devalued in stratified categories of India today. By implication, city people's lives are being devalued in stratified and societies because their experiences, their creativity, their knowledge, their speech patterns are compelled to be suspended in order that they could be included amongst those that compel other groups and subgroups to sheepishly agree that they are now being civilized. The intricate and complex life ways of organized manner of speaking, cooking, relating to one another, are being asked to be jettisoned in the tantalizing image of modernity and inclusivity. So the particularity and richness and diversity of city people are being told to be quiet. Is it not true? As we learn from our own ancestors, our own grandparents and our own people today, that if you want to disrupt the discursive of colonization, we must begin from home. To pay attention to several languages, those that we have been using before we embraced Western essays type of literacy and ways of looking at ourselves. Otherwise, as the African saying goes, in the court of chickens, the cockroach has no advocate. If this is the case, we have to, by necessity, approach that which we have received about ourselves with what Elizabeth Fiorenza calls hermeneutics or interpretation of suspicion. That is a healthy skepticism as academics maintain. Unfortunately, we have not learned to debunk authorized versions of the realities that have been given to us. But then there is another proverb from our ancestors in Africa. They say, the handle of the axe once went to the forest to tell the trees, look at me, I used to be one of you. By implication, it is a warning that what happened to a tree branch in the past could happen to the other trees in the forest. It is only when people become aware of what they have and of all colonized minds, feelings and attitudes that we can begin to tear ourselves away from the colonized perspectives. So how do we as has been mentioned, mental enslavement is not always caused by Euro-Americans because you and I live in colonized environment. Since those that are married to the status quo always prevent others from coming up with ways of tearing themselves away. As Stuart Hall, the cultural theorist puts it, colonization is powerful. It glides, it slides, and it's found among citizens of global south as well as those of global north, constantly disempowering others. So, Mira Sabratnam, argues this way in her decolonizing intervention international state building in mozambique 
she says, it is imperative all the global South people to take their rightful places in the co-production of knowledge. By this, she means, if we allow others to produce knowledge about ourselves and not pay attention to our own resources, who will always be imaged in what Ngugi Wationgo has also described in his decolonizing the mind. Even the very languages, gestures that are often used, if we don't combine them with our own, then we will be found wanting and we'll be strangers in our own land. So how have CDs, in conclusion, set up, staged counter-hegemonic gaze to liberate themselves, even though they were brought to other lands through roadblocks, street theater, demonstrations, they have been staging their counter-hegemonic positions that redefine themselves to express their agency. For instance, although in 1987, the Karnataka state passed a law to protect the rights of citizens to their land, the law was eventually endorsed by the central government in 1994. Yet, yet, as of today, there are cities and other socially deprived communities that cannot lay claim to the lands on which they have built their houses or they farm. They therefore face what others have called ecological terrorism at the hands of the powerful because first they have depenalized them. They have vilified the cities because they were described as the people that do not deserve to occupy those lands. So how do they deal with this? And I'll come to that soon. Or take the case of some cities in Marine Copa in Uttara Canada, Northern Karnataka, who have lived for 50 years near a pond, but cannot fish unless they get permission from a rich and powerful person who has put a bait on the fish in the pond. Because Cities may not have documents to their lands, may not have deeds to their property, and yet we often assert that for centuries their forebears have lived and worked on the lands that they occupy now. It is no surprise, therefore, that three years ago, CDs staged Rasta Roko roadblocks to prevent some rich and powerful people from dispossessing some CD families. How about when a CD man in 2017 cut a tree branch to roof his house? The women in some of the villages went on demonstration, demonstration and, and then prevented the forest, forest department from arresting this young man, man and, and then, then taking, taking him to jail. jail. Or how about the fascinating idea of women in three city villages of Mainali, Ugingiri, Punshetikopa, staging another Rasta Roko on October 2nd to push for the shutting down of liquor stores in those villages. Ask why. They chose that day, October 2nd. The leader's answer was simple. She wanted the protest to happen on Gandhiji's birth date. So local events are given national significance as the women reworked their lived concerns into a national day of prayers and for peace and social action. To conclude, the challenges faced by early freedom fighters in Africa, India, and around the world have not, not ended. ended. It, it is, is our duty, duty. the cities are doing, to take up the mantle and engage all colonizing circumstances and exclusionary systems from within and without. We have to be bold to forge and report strategized ways of knowing 
re-emphasize our cherished values of integrity, corporate responsibility, and accountability, so that decolonization will demonopolize the constructs that privileged and powerful people have always been imposing on us to create the us versus them mentality. It will help us, therefore, to develop the intellect, the morals, the social aspects that embrace all to include women and men, ethnicities, races, people that are physically, emotionally challenged. And when we do that, we then will have embarked on the journey of decolonization for today and tomorrow. Because let it not be said about us that we have met the enemy and he is us. As Pogo popularized this from General Perry. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Professor uh, Taj from now on. <laughs> uh,